the uh, nine o'clock service was just ending as I walked down. You were in for yet another fantastic message today on All Saints Sunday. So I told Rebecca, uh, you know, last week was sort of the head fake. You got me and not Rebecca this morning, also a head fake. You get me for at least 10 minutes before Rebecca uh, comes down. And uh, uh, so this is week two of our discussion on Love Your Enemies in preparation for Arthur Brooks coming to speak on uh, the 16th. Um, and you saw the book, the books outside. And so what I told Rebecca that I would do today, I'll do a little bit of a recap of last week for those who weren't here. And then what we thought we would do over the course of the next few weeks is walk through the chapters of the book. Last week was m- more of an introduction. Ah, well, I, I don't even have to have to wait that, that long. You were quick. <laughs> um, and so we'll do a little bit of an introduction, and then we'll, we'll talk about chapters, at least chapters two and three uh, today. We might get to chapter four, but what we also thought as Rebecca and I were talking about this is we're going to try to, we had some great discussion and questions uh, toward the end, and so wanted to leave some time for that to, uh, to occur, uh, or just stop us as we're doing this in the middle. So let me give a, a, a quick recap. So um, Britz's book is all about the culture of contempt that we have. Uh, And contempt is disgust mixed with anger. It is the belief in the utter worthlessness of the person with whom you are disagreeing. And of course, Jesus commands us to love your enemies. He said, what is it? Even sinners love their friends or love those who love them. And so that is why he, com- he commands us uh, to love our, our enemies. And Rebecca, in her sermon last week and the, and the message this week, talks about our enemies. But Brooks, at the beginning, says, what does it mean to love? And says, you know, love can be, when he asks his class, which he teaches at Harvard about on happiness, he says, what, what is love? And people say, oh, love is this feeling that you get when you are in love in love with someone. And that is love as a, feel, as a feeling. And Jesus says, and uh, Thomas Aquinas says, love is a verb. Love is an action. Love is the thing that we can do to others. And Aquinas, Brooks notes, says, what is, what is love? He says that... <clears throat> Let me get the quote right, because when you quote Thomas Aquinas, you should probably quote him correctly. Um, Aquinas says, to love is to will the good of the other. And then Catholic theologian Michael Novak adds on to that, to love is to will the good of the other as the other. And that's where to love your enemies comes from. And so Brooks says we have to overcome this culture of contempt that we have and where society puts all of these pressures on us to have contempt, to think of the other as the other, not to will their good. And at Trinity, we talked about how we can do that here and how wonderful it is at Trinity being the quintessential purple church where we are not right, we are not left, we are one community. That doesn't mean that we don't have disagreements, but we disagree with each other in love. We will the good of the other at Trinity. And then we ended by talking about the end of the book, but I want to repeat it because it's actually worth talking about because it tees into our discussion today, uh, which are Brutz's rules for us. And so we will repeat these at each of our sessions. And here's the rules. Rule number one, do y'all remember? Stand up to the man, right? Stand up to the man. Our culture is pervasive with those who want to have authority and control what we think, whether that's social media, whether where we get our news from, the blinders that we put on when we were dealing with others. Stand up to the man who's trying to tell you what to think. Refuse to be used by the powerful. Number two, escape the bubble. 
Go where you're not invited, he says, and say things that people don't expect, but say them in love. Say no, number three, say no to contempt. Treat others with love and respect, even when it is difficult. And that's going to tee into the discussion on chapters two and three today. And his final rule is tune out, turn off the stuff that leads to that culture of contempt. Just turn it off. Your life will be incredibly better for it. Just turn it off. Don't listen to it. And we'll talk a little bit about about that today. So that is the sort of framework for the discussion today, which are chapters two and three about, and and for those of you who, uh, uh, which is, can you afford to be nice? Can you afford it in this culture? And then love lessons for leaders. And if we get to it uh, in chapter four, which is how can I love my enemies if they are immoral? Um, so before uh, uh, we, we start on this, let me, let me you know, just open it up. Questions or thoughts on that before we dive into the discussion for today? Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, this, this goes at uh, the heart of an, an issue that's uh, un, unraveling right now uh, in, in the Middle East uh, with people who are totally ignoring the teachings of Jesus. Uh, at, at what point, uh, when you become critical of that behavior, and uh, are really endorsing the behavior, on the other hand. Uh, the, the despicable behavior that's taking place, and it's open to interpretation, I guess, but uh, it's, very, it's very difficult to look at uh, some people's behavior at times and turn the other cheek. Oh, yeah. Well, and Arthur mentions it a, a, a little bit in, in the book, and in the chapters today, uh, he talks about and says, okay, the Middle East problem, intractable. You and I are not going to solve that problem, right? But, but he mentions Nelson Mandela, right? Apartheid was an intractable, intractable, a really bad problem. <laughs> But he, talks, but he talks about Mandela and talks about King. But look, there is evil, right? Rest assured, right? You, you can't sit there. No one can sit there and say that the terrorist actions of Hamas had any goodness in them. And that is not going to be solved by, but loving and moving toward peace, and I may, may let our, you know, our, our peacemaking minister uh, even answer and discuss this one, but it is more about what we can do as a community to, fo- to foster that. But we're not going to solve the middle the Middle East crisis, sadly, uh, at this church. But we can, in fact, understand what Jesus says. And Jesus actually says, all he mentions in the book, Jesus says, "I, I did not come to be a peacemaker." Right? He can't, he said, "I came to be. I came with the sword. The sword in that case is." Is is not you know like the sword of a, of a of of the battle, but but it is to to divide good and bad, and making sure that individuals understand that there will be suffering, and but you have to have suffering that is for God. Um, but I don't have an answer to the Middle East peace problem. I actually think that's a great question to ask Arthur because in one of his podcasts he has a pretty articulate discussion around the the, the Middle East. Uh, problems there, but it's a, it's a terrible, terrible thing. But what we can do, of course, is have discussions about it. There are people in this room who are going to differ on what the solution to the middle, and think about when Sandra Mackey was here for, for years, giving, giving her incredible, incredible discussions uh, uh, around that, but we can still have discussions around it in love. Other questions before we roll into Chapter two and three, and maybe four. Rebecca, do you want to tee us off on that? Would you like this? Shall I give you this? Okay. You have to keep talking too. Are, were you planning to leave? Say that again. Were you planning to leave? I, how about if I stand right here? 
How about if we stand on opposite sides of this pulpit? All right. <laughs> but very close to the center. Both of us, very close to the center. So to pick up a little bit from Terry's question about intractable problems, one of the frameworks that Arthur Brooks is pushing is our awareness of when we're talking at cross purposes, when we're not using the same, he doesn't say vocabulary, but when we're not pursuing the same conversation, you all have been in conversations like this, where you're trying to say something you're passionate about and the experience is the other person is not listening to me. Have you had that experience? You all have, even if you're not nodding. You probably had it yesterday because it's a very common one in our culture. And the other person, no surprise, feels the same way about you. They're saying something equally passionate and they feel like you're not hearing them. And it's actually maybe because we're not listening to each other. That's one of our challenges as a culture now that we're listening. This is one of the rules Brooke sets up that we're listening to respond rather than listening to learn or be changed. But he makes the point that it might also be that we are speaking from different core values. So each of us is pursuing something in that passionate remark we're making or argument that is important to us, but so is the other person, and we haven't yet figured out where the common value is. So this is jumping all the way to chapter four, where he goes into a pretty lengthy um, discussion of Jonathan Haidt's framework of shared morals in our country. Has anyone read Jonathan Haidt? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> well, these might not be the things that you have on the tip of your tongue all the time, but Brooks is saying that studies show, you know, there are all, all sorts of social science research data that tell us that, in fact, even people we think we hate and have nothing in common with and could never agree with probably do share some common values with us. And we miss the opportunity in the way we communicate to figure out what that is and to start there. So instead of starting to change somebody or tell them they're wrong or show that they have no value, back to the culture of contempt, if we figured out what value we share and said, look, don't we both want this? And how do we approach that from different ways? Totally different conversation, right? If you haven't read the book, you might not guess at what these two values that supposedly all of us share that are sort of hardwired into us are. But what would you guess? What are some things that no matter who we think we all share? Family. Family. Okay. So relationships, people we want to love, right? Love. What else? Personal safety. Yeah, that's actually lower on his list, but that's sort of one that comes into play. Any others? Well, what do you all value? This isn't a trick question, friends. <laughs> Community? Relationship with God. Faith is a little bit of a, of a sort of higher level framework than what he's talking about, but it's the source for some of this. All right, I'll give you the answers, and you can read chapter four later this week. He says fairness and compassion. How does that strike you? Hmm, you're like, hmm, I don't know. I might know some people who don't seem to care about fairness and compassion. Is that what you're thinking? I saw some heads do the, eh, er, er. Yeah, so this is maybe a point where we have some, some teasing out to do as he gets there because he, he tries to take some example arguments that are intractable, right? They're the ones that are so hot that immediately we all jump to our positions and are ready to do battle. And he says, what if we reframed these and put something that would achieve fairness in the middle or something that would achieve compassion in the middle and came to the middle from our different directions? So he has sort of both a topical analysis and a process proposal. And maybe we don't agree with it. We'll see. John Tyrrell. Where it's helped me to reframe it to think fairness is you 
he's always given them to do the, to do the right thing or, or to be on the right path. <laughs> That's uh, from the sermon today. And, I'm so glad you were listening, John. Thank you. They catch that. <laughs> yeah, it's not subtle. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Is, is I think we, fairness can have a negative connotation in society, and it really just has a positive connotation. Yeah, oh, I forgot to take you a mic. Could you all hear? John, what he said? Okay. So he's taking us straight to one of the challenges of, I think, this book and this entire pursuit is, even if we're trying to appeal to a common value, do we understand it to mean the same thing, right? Do we think fairness, do we all think fairness is the same? Do we all think compassion looks the same? Maybe not. And he actually talks about that. We're going to sort of end up going in reverse order. We can do that. (laughs) Takes us back to his sort of definitions of of how we view the leadership we need and how we view the way to accomplish some of those values. So even if you and I said, hey, we both want fairness, how we understand that to look as an outcome might be different and very likely how we think we get there would be different, right? Any other thoughts about fairness and compassion before we go backwards? Can, can I add on top of that? Please. So there's this interesting thing in, about fairness being nat- nature or nurture, mm-hmm. and which is why he pops into the discussion and he uses hype stuff about, about, about fairness because you look at any, any young kid, any toddlers playing with toys, and there is an inherent understanding without having been taught the moral values and moral framework of fairness of what is fair in sharing, right? And, and who has what, and, and the unfairness of only getting, you know, not the cookie, you know, or something, not, right? But, but there is, right, they're not taught a moral framework, but they understand innately the concept of fairness at that most, most basic level, which then tees into to the compassion piece. And of course, then it all gets muddied, clouded as we, you know, grow and learn, but, but there's, a, there's a whole natural instinct there for, for fairness. John? I was just going to say, if you were to ask everybody, what's the definition of fairness, there probably would be different yep. definitions. Um, but let's pretend that the impartial and just treatment or behavior without favoritism or discrimination. Thank you, Mr. Webster. <laughs> <laughs> John has spoken. <laughs> that is helpful. I mean, that's sort of what, we're, what he's trying to get to is, is there some core nugget that we can all agree on, right? And then how do we achieve that in terms of what we do? Harvey. When you mentioned fairness and compassion, I thought a bit about the, is somewhat of a trade-off in many cases. In yesterday's paper, there was a, an article about uh, Uh, how many working class people have become more conservative in their voting because of the immigration issue. And their view is open immigration is unfair to them in employment and in schooling and in health care and other ways, while most of us, our view of, of, of immigration is from a compassionate standpoint. I didn't see that in yesterday's paper, but it would have been a great case it study. Either, it was either in the journal or the, uh, or the New York Times about how much uh, uh, working class people had switched from Biden to anti-Biden over that issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's actually talking about something very similar. Um, Brooks is talking about something very similar as he focuses on this what he calls different expressions of the same value. And I'm, I'm reframing that as sort of, if we share some value and we're trying to understand what that is, we would come at it in different ways. So he makes that very point with a couple of different case studies, including some of how people's voting attitudes, voting postures have changed because of their differing perceptions of what is fair and what is compassionate. Um, and he uses fairness in particular and, <sighs> divides us, and this may be a false division because he also acknowledges that we perhaps all live in both camps at once. He uses these frameworks of redistributive fairness 
and meritocratic fairness so that some of us would view that in order for things to become fair, there must be some redistribution from where we are now. And others would put emphasis more on meritocracy and the idea that you get what you deserve or you get what you earn. He also acknowledges that those are not clean lines, right? That there's probably some of each of those thoughts in each of our understanding of how we would get to fairness. But that same voting demographic that you're talking about, Harvey, is very much his case study in his discussion of fairness. So it's fascinating. Terry, give me two seconds. I'll respond uh, to this, this. But that, it, it, okay. an argument can be made that uh, fairness and compassion are not footnotes of the Ten Commandments. Yes. Uh, so he's not using the Ten Commandments as his framework. Um, he's appealing beyond what we would understand as religious law toward a broader... Um, he's looking for what are innate values. So as uh, Bill was talking about how toddlers will behave before they've been explicitly taught something, he's trying to find what that core thing is that people would share and perhaps even would know apart from any particular religious tradition. For us, as we're listening to it and our people who are guided by the Ten Commandments, we would look to that authority as part of our source for what we value. But when he's using these, this list of values as a framework, he's not appealing so directly there. But I'm with you. I don't think fairness and compassion are footnotes to anything. Yeah. Is that helpful? Okay. What on were you on the political framework discussion, it's, there's, a, there's a fascinating statistic that even though I am like a political junkie, I didn't know. Um, so shocking, um, which, is, which is this. Um, uh, he examines moments of economic crises throughout history, throughout the US, U.S. history largely, and finds that following that, there is what Brooks would call or, or other, others would call coercive leadership. And he distinguishes between coercive leadership and authoritative leadership. And we'll talk a little bit about both, but coercive leadership is leadership that is not with compassion, fairness, respect for the other. It is much more about an appeal to those who are suffering, I say suffering, not suffering in, in that it's a loving appeal, but, but almost a, uh, an, an, an appeal uh, for, for that person's, for that candidate, for that leader's own political gain. And he examines, and one can have a, have a dispute about this, but it says Trump and Sanders arising largely out of uh, an appeal to the downtrodden, to those who are economically on the, on the margins, are two sides of the same coin. Um, that, that Sanders, he would say, used the politics of envy, while Trump used the politics of exclusion. But here's the stat that I didn't realize, which is that at the general election, 12% of Sanders supporters switched and voted for Trump, and that was the margin of difference in Wisconsin and in Pennsylvania and in Minnesota, that one can look, look at that because they were both appealing in this very, like, I'm going to come in and s smash the tables, uh, as, as, as he says, and break the rules and appeal to, in many ways, two sides of the, of the same coin in the group. No, Grant, they had very different policy prescriptions. They're very different people. But it was just fascinating that that was the appeal that led to ultimately, when you just look at the at the at the voting uh, the voting patterns, that that was the margin of victory in those those three states. And it's just a it's just a fascinating discussion. And he holds that up as coercive leadership, rather than authoritative leadership, which is leadership where one is looking for the other, where you are looking at the compassion that you can feel to lift others up, to respect the dignity of those, of those individuals, and holds up again Mandela and King uh, and, and others in that as, as the ideal. It is the opposite of holding, up, holding those in contempt. Sadler, did you have your hand up? I'm You're thinking. <laughs> okay. Alan, can you hand, there you go, thank you. People's ideas of fairness 
mm -hmm. uh, are going to be very different. And I'm not quite, I haven't read the book, so I don't know exactly what he said. But um, it seems to me that, that rather than being a common point, it may be perhaps a starting point from different sides. I don't know. But I think people, you know, just the concept of what's fair is so different than different people. So how, do, how does he address that? I think he leaves that open, in part because it's bigger than he can answer. But this is at the heart of what Bill was just talking about with the different styles of leadership he develops. And I think he's pushing us to try to understand why we, as people who are empowered to choose a leader, would choose certain leaders. So this, this picture of how a leader uses power or uses authority very much ties into what he's saying about fairness. So for example, so as Bill just said, he, he identifies these two types of leaders, one coercive, and what would you think a coercive leader would do? What's coercion? Forcing, mandatory, go so far as to say bullying, right? This is a person who uses power in an aggressive way, in a dictatorial way. He uses the language of tyrant sometimes. And a coercive leader very much relies on a view of fairness, but it is often an offense, right? So I have been wronged. I take offense at something that was unfair, that victimized me. That is at the core of a coercive leader's narrative. On the other side, he uses the framework of an authoritative leader, not an authoritarian leader, which is a little confusing that those words are so close together, but it is about how someone uses authority. So an authoritative leader is not a pushover. This is a person who is claiming and using power, but not for self. So the authority is invoked to create fairness on behalf of another in an authoritative leader. So he, he talks a good bit, bit about righteous anger, sort of how righteous indignation comes up. So anger or in, indignation maybe as opposed to righteous anger or indignation. And an authoritative leader sees outside him or herself what is unfair and then uses power to work for that, removing him or herself somewhat from the narrative so that fairness isn't about a personal affront. It's about a broken system that can be, anger can be fueled toward making change. Now, how you get from one to the other, I think, is the, is the challenge right? Because he speaks very plainly about how in a crisis moment, even people who don't otherwise think they want to be coerced still choose a coercive leader. We've seen this happen in our own space. He gives the anecdote of having been in the Barcelona Symphony. Arthur Brooks is a French horn player. And uh, symphonies, you know, are often Mm, emotionally tense places where a conductor has to have authority. And he talks about how as a young player in Barcelona, the orchestra was a hot mess. And people, even, you know, Arthur Brooks's stand partner, thought they wanted a tyrant. They thought, even though this will make life miserable for me because this maestro is going to belittle me and put me down and make me feel horrible about myself, and he talks about missing some notes and being publicly shamed by the maestro, even knowing that, they still thought that's what they needed because they were in such crisis and there was such division within the orchestra. So he extrapolates that to a national politics situation where in crisis, even people who don't think they like coercion would still choose a coercive leader. Fairness is under there. I'm not sure that he resolves the question of how we get from our differing views of fairness to an agreed upon center. Do you think he answers that? Um, I, I think he leaves it up to us. I think it's up to us. Yeah, uh, and, and, and long, right? It's a long journey to there. Jim Blitch, did you have a question? Well, let, before, uh, hold on, let's hang on a minute. <laughs> let, let, let me, um, I hate reading, these, but, but the righteous anger piece, I yeah. think is actually worth a, a, a read on, on this. So 
because I think it sets up this whole coercive versus authoritative di dynamic. And he says, um, uh, anger comes in two forms. Anger that is on one's behalf and anger that is on behalf of others. Coercive leaders get angry on their own behalf. Their anger is an expression of pride. On the contrast, he says, righteous anger of an authoritative leader doesn't cast anyone into the outer darkness. It always promises to be forgotten when things are set right because authoritative leaders have no permanent enemies and are capable of love for all. Authoritative leaders, however, can get angry, but they're actually still nice people. Righteous anger, he says, is actually an expression of generosity. It is kind to stand up for those who are oppressed. It is compassionate to fight for those who are weaker than you are. This kind of generosity is not weakness. It is hard and it is tough. Anger on behalf of somebody weaker than you, excuse me, weaker than you, strengthens your position as a leader. And then he cites James Q. Wilson, who's one of his mentors in the moral sense, and says, anger is the necessary handmaiden of sympathy and fairness, and we are wrong to try to make everyone sweet and reasonable, which I, I just, I thought that was great. And good luck if you do. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say one quick thing, and then Jim Blitch is next. I'm part of an organization called Presbyterians for a Better Georgia. You're all welcome to join us. And it's a bipartisan advocacy group, and we only focus on health care and housing in our state, believing as a core value that God's people should all be able to count on safe housing and access to health care. And we go and lobby every spring at the Capitol. A handful of folks in here. Did you go last year, Leslie? handful of folks have been who went at least one. Okay, I thought there would be more of you. But there were some who go to the Capitol. And our one mantra is no permanent enemies, no permanent friends. Anyone who will gather around the shared value to try to ensure adequate housing and health care for our siblings in this state is a friend, right? We will, we will group together. And Brooks makes the point that that dynamic has been lost and at our national legislative level that for generations, even if people were running against one another in politics, and even sometimes spoke publicly in ways that didn't sound kind, they actually did respect each other were friends and would gather around shared policy goals and that that dynamic has been lost, that we are not seeing that. I mean, all we have to do is read the paper to know that that's not happening as it should be. Finally, Jim Blitch, apologies. Yeah. It's, it's, I haven't read the book either, so confession there, but it's difficult for me to understand fairness as a value that we all subscribe to. I think it's an aspirational value. But, I mean, I look at, you know, I understand it as love your enemy, which is difficult. Uh, love your neighbor. It's very difficult to love your neighbor sometimes. But I look at it also uh, legally, and my view, I'd love to have Bill's view on this, but we wrote fairness into the Constitution with the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. But you look at that throughout history, it's often very, very narrowly interpreted. And we've done things many, many times to different groups to limit, exclude. It's not something like we're all trying to be fair to each other. Oftentimes the goal is to win and to keep you over there. And so, I don't know, I haven't read the book yet, but it's just difficult for me to understand that is something we all subscribe to. Mm -hmm. You wanna take that 14th Amendment? Well, during the ratification debates on the 14th, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> Um, I, what I would say, the core of the book is not that, that there is an appeal to, to fairness. It is that, that treating those with having love, willing the good of the other, and avoiding the, the, the cycle of disgust and anger that leads to contempt, is, is that, I don't think he would, would even pretend to say that all results are fair or that fairness is the, is the ultimate virtue. But what that is, though, is there is a sense of innate fairness that sort of embodied. But your, your definition of fair, my definition of, of, of fair could very well be, be different. But we can have discussions around that. And that's why, to go back to the, San, the Sanders-Trump thing, one, one envy, one exclusion. 
or the immigration discussion that we were just having, right? There's, there's this, this whole debate about excluding and the wall versus wel welcoming the stranger, which is, which is right, which is better economically uh, for the country for, for, that, for that matter, um, which is better for, for the safety of, of the country. Those are, all, those are all realistic policy debates that one can have, and, and depending upon where you come from, you can say that one is more fair than, than the other. So, so that's why, that's why the fairness, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the fairness answer is not in fact answered. It is a, it is a question about how to have a discussion around what would be fair. What is fair is compassion for others, right? Respect, respect for those who are, who are less fortunate, showing gratitude, um, being nice, which we'll talk a little bit about some of his hacks for being, for being nice, uh, uh, in, in, in just a second. But I don't think that he says like, oh, and this is, this is how one could look at the Constitution and look at the, 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 four, the 14th Amendment to say, that, oh, well, there's, there is an answer to what in fact is fair. Because we'll each have different answers to that. And we keep litigating it. <laughs> For all the years <laughs> since it was ratified, we've been litigating what it means, right? Who's protected and who isn't and what's fair and what isn't. I didn't mean to send us down a rabbit trail that elevated fairness. So to, to zoom back out a little bit, um, as Bill said in his recap, the goal of the book is to help us see with clarity that, clarity that we live in a culture of contempt where we are perpetually being given narratives that tell us to hate other or to mistreat other or to demonize and dehumanize other. And he's trying to get tactical somewhat. He's trying to give us some concrete things we can do to help see that and then break it down. So the conversation about fairness comes in a, a chapter that's really about how to engage other, right? How do we even try? And one of the frameworks he uses for that is, are there common values to which we can appeal? But maybe we come all the way back to where we were supposed to start, which is niceness. 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 So the title of chapter two is, can you afford to be nice? What do you think? Yes? That was a smiling yes from Roberta. Nice guys finish last. I just said that in my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> nice guys finish last. Do they? <laughs> Thank you for that straight up, Eve. Sometimes, yes, there's a reason this is sort of a cultural idea we have because we have seen that happen, right? It isn't totally without truth. Sometimes being nice doesn't pay, so to speak. But maybe other times, oh, John Tyrrell. I think... For me, the answer on do nice guys finish last depends upon how long you measure the term. If you measure it in a very short term, often nice people finish last. But if you measure it over our lives, the answer is absolutely not. Nice people finish first. That'll preach, John Tyrrell. <laughs> the last shall be first. Terry. I hate to dwell on this, but I feel very strongly about it. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, being stern uh, for leaders and making uh, 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 corrections or punishing for people who uh, do something wrong. Um, there's a difference between writing the rules and also enforcing the rules. That's dictatorship. But it's different when a person uses existing standards or rules and, in, and uses the, uh, tenacity in enforcing that rules that had been agreed to by others. And, and uh, I think there's a difference between writing the rules, enforcing the rules, and or just enforcing the rules. If that makes sense. It does make sense. I'm not sure that's the conversation he's pursuing. So when he's talking about the leadership we choose, as he's focusing on this country and sort of the political backdrop, um, this book is a few years old, so it was, is it 2019? 2019. So he's looking particularly at the lead up to and then the immediate 
experience of the 2016 election and the, you know, now it's almost become cliche to say we're so polarized, but you know, some years ago, maybe we weren't, or maybe we were less polarized. So he's, he's trying to cast light on the sort of how we got here, less on the process of legislation and more on the dynamics of leadership that we see rising and why. So particularly in the demographics of this country, as Bill mentioned, whose persuasions changed, why did they change? And what sort of narratives from leaders were persuasive to people? Why did they either want Sanders or Trump, and then some switch from Sanders to Trump? Why did that happen is really what he's looking at more than sort of the legislative process and enforcement. But, you know, if we think about carrying those leadership styles out to their natural ends, there would be differences in terms of enforcement and how power is retained. There would absolutely be differences. Chris, Betts. In the term of fairness and being nice, in my sense, we have lost the concept of the common good, mm. that those things, when, when, you, when you really think of the common good, meaning everybody, then that involves being nice as well as being fair. Mm. Yeah, I think you would agree with that. Don't yeah, you think so? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think he is trying to appeal to our personal experiences. So uh, nice is a little bit of a I don't know, it's a little bit of a puny word maybe, but he's I don't know, maybe y'all love it, but I was like, eh, nice. Um I think what he's trying to say is that we have experienced a shift in how uh we receive and give something as basic as kindness how we treat one another and how we expect to be treated and where those expectations start to be different so that we expect kindness when we're not giving kindness, right? When we have been able to other people, so to cast them as unworthy of our kindness, but yet we still see ourselves as worthy of kindness from others, that that gap is a huge problem for our country. I think that is part of what he's trying to say. He, he talks about the nice aspect in, in this way of, of saying nice and, and, and goes through studies of relationships, being nice in the workplace, and being nice in leadership, and by that sort of civic, civic or political leadership, and finds that in relationships, the, the, the studies are that niceness overcomes a lack of attractiveness, thank goodness, um, uh, and that, but that, but that goes, you know, all of the studies will, will, uh, that he cites demonstrates that in the workplace, that's, that's, that you means get to I go have to, to go, sorry. <laughs> um, in the, par parting, parting words. Uh, see you in worship. <laughs> um, we'll wrap, we'll wrap, wrap this up after this one in the work, in the workplace, uh, he says that, that in, in site, site studies that, that you'll see, that being nice leads one to be the person from whom people will seek advice. It makes you appear more competent uh, and that uh, uh, it enables you to be perceived more as a leader and cites these stories. He's, he's like, I'm not making this up. Here are the, here are the studies. And in leadership, he says that uh, uh, the, the way to influence and cites Again, studies that, that, that you, can, you can read there. The way to influence and to lead is to begin with warmth. He says, warmth is the conduit of influence. It facilitates trust and communication and the absorption of ideas. And he says, okay, and it cites Man Mandela, which we don't have time to get into, but we can talk about it a little bit more for those who saw the movie Invictus, which was really an incredible thing about Mandela you know, taking on the and, and becoming a, a supporter uh, of the rugby team in South Africa 
uh, that then let Matt Damon and uh, you know Clint Eastwood, Morgan Freeman played played Mandela in that in that movie, and it's just a fantastic, uplifting, uplifting movie. But the rugby team was sort of the embodiment of apartheid, um, and he learned about rugby from his white captors, um, who kept him in prison. So it's a great it's a great story. But, but uh, and I'll end with this, which is the the hacks he says for niceness. And he said, look, sometimes it's hard to, it's hard to be nice. Uh, he said, my, num- uh, my hack number one is fake it. <laughs> Which I thought, <laughs> and he said, look, and he said, he said, but here's why. And cite studies where, where um, the participants are forced to frown or forced to smile. And those who are forced to smile actually ended up being happier, healthier, having more positive relationships. And you can read all this and, you know, have skepticism around it or ask him when he, when he comes. But I thought it was great. And you just, you know, and one naturally knows this just from your day-to-day existence. If you are there frowning, you are more likely to be unhappy than if you are smiling. Um, and he says, no, hack number two is show gratitude. Show gratitude for others. He said it is remarkably hard to hate someone for whom you are just showing gratitude. And, uh, and he walks through and then cites again uh, uh, the basis for this book from, from, uh, from Jesus' um, sermon, which is, you know, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them, but love your enemies, and then your reward will be great. He also cites Lincoln's first inaugural, we are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies, though passion may have strained it must not break the bonds of our affection. So fake it and show gratitude. Um, and that's probably good for today so that folks can get in, or, but, but we can do quick questions if you all have, have time. Yes, ma'am. Leslie. I wanna use a current event as a basis for the whole compassion question. And, and ask you, I mean, I understand he says turn off the noise. Does that mean you don't read the news, you don't watch the news, or do you do it with a certain spirit? Because if we don't, like, I'm going to use the example of the Middle East concern. And I have to say, watching the images on television and in the newspaper, looking at those, and listening to a variety of people talking about it have taught me so much. I mean, I really didn't understand the difference between Hamas and everyday Palestinians. And I think that's pretty basic to what's happening. And so what what does he really mean by that? And I, I, I see that as a development of compassionate powers that we have the ability to feel with others. So I think that, and you, sh- you can ask, should ask him this as well. My view on this is rule number three, right, uh, right above the turn off, off the noise is go, or, or one of the rules is go where you're not invited and say things that are not expected. And so that means to turn off the confirmation bias noise, that if you are a reader of the Wall Street Journal, read the New York Times. It doesn't mean that, oh, if you're the, if you're the Fox viewer, Go listen to MSNBC, although you can. I'll tell you a quick MSNBC story, but um, uh, but but it is it is to in fact go to those other places and seek to understand the views that others others are 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 coming from, rather than the one piece that's good. Like you're great, you believe. Oh my gosh, my beliefs are absolutely fantastic because they are. But no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding since this is being recorded. But you know what I mean? It, it, is, it is to seek that from, from others and seek that information from, from others. You don't have to just, but to turn off that which is horrible and polluting and just, you know, leading you down the, the path of, 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 of what some, you know, toward extremism on, on either side to the avoidance of, of hearing any of the other voices. Um, MS, quick MSNBC story, and I know you got to go. Um, so I, I, I talked about the, I, I held up the book enough last week, and people were like, what is that book? So as some of you know, I was involved uh, representing a woman named, a uh, wonderful woman named uh, Cassidy Hutchinson in the January 6th uh, uh, hearings, and happy to talk more about that, uh, uh, but not, not today for this. I'll tell you this quick MSNBC story. So I went, when the book came out, 
uh, about four weeks ago, um, and Cassie was going on her initial rounds of interviews. I went to New York because I thought, this is fun. When is a litigator from Atlanta ever going to get to go and, you know, sit around and meet all of these, uh, uh, you know, interesting people as somebody is doing a book tour and, you know, incredible interviews. And so I, I went and met with, uh, uh, she was on Lawrence O'Donnell almost for the full hour and spent quite a bit of time afterwards talking to O'Donnell, um, who is an MSNBC commentator, certainly left, left of center, certainly left of my political views, but we had a fascinating discussion. And he said, look, I recognize who the typical view, MSNBC viewer is. And he said, I actually view part of my role as a journalist is to try to give at least something to those who are on the far left on the MSNBC side, a little center left viewpoint or even a, a center right viewpoint. And I view that as, as my service to the MSNBC viewer. And one can look back and think about, think about things that we've seen on CNN or on Fox before they became so polarized. And you can question whether O'Donnell is doing that in the right way, but that was at least the articulated uh, view that he was trying to have for his viewers on MSNBC, which I thought was a very you know, lofty and worthy, worthy goal for, for him to have. Um, and he's just a very nice, nice guy who I never would have had the opportunity to meet, meet otherwise. Um, so it was a fascinating discussion with him. I do think we need to roll. So thank you all, and we'll be back next week.